Hi, it's been a long and windy, winding road, but we're now in the last chapter of the book. It's a short one, so I'll keep it focused. And here are some of the messages I hope you've received as you went through the book. The first is when you think about value, don't think of just a number, think of what drives value. So as we've gone from you know, young growth companies all the way to commodity companies, we've looked at drivers of value that have shifted as we've looked at different kinds of companies. With young growth companies, here are the drivers of value. How quickly can you go to revenues? How quickly can you turn profitable, your target margin, and will you survive? With growth companies, the question becomes one of scaling. You've grown a lot over the past, but can you continue doing it now that you're a bigger company and you can sustain margins? With mature companies, it's about you know how well are you managed? Are you taking advantage of your operating efficiencies and your debt capacity? And can management change? With declining companies, it's not just about how quickly will you decline and become a going concern, but is there a chance of distress? Have you brought that into the process? With financial service companies, the big deal is about it's everything is focused on equity, but it's about regulatory capital and how you deal with and what kind of returns you can deliver on the equity invest in the company. With commodity and cyclical companies, it's about you know what kind of earnings do you make in a normalized price level. So making money as an oil company, an oil price is 125 is easy, but you can you make money, generate enough returns at a $50 or $60 oil price. That's what's going to drive your value. With intangible asset companies, really, it's not about coming up with different rules, but redoing the accounting so you're bringing those intangible assets onto the books. So when you look at the value of a company, not only should you be focused on the number, you should be thinking about what are the levers of value, what drives the value of the company, and sometimes the only way to answer that is to actually value the company and try changing each lever, growth, margins, reinvestment, and risk, to see which one has the biggest impact. Now, the reason, of course, we do valuation is we hope to benefit from that valuation, make money off our valuations if we're investors. Now, just as a cautionary note, I mean, whether you can make money on your valuation or not is going to depend on three things. The first is the quality of your valuation. Just because you've done an intrinsic valuation doesn't mean you're ahead of the pack. If what you've done is taken historical data and just you know, extended it out, we live in a world where ChatGPT can do it for us, and it's not going to create valuations that are any better than just taking the market price. So the better the quality of your valuation, not just in terms of inputs, but the story you're told and converting into value, is going to be a part, a partly a fact in whether you can make money in your valuation. Second, whether you like it or not, you're ultimately at the mercy of the market. You can be right about value, but if the market never comes around to your point of view, you're never going to make money. So the extent that the market gives you feedback, that market feedback is going to determine whether you make money. So if your value is right and the market adjusts to that value, you're more likely to make money than if that doesn't happen. And the third factor is luck. I mean, let's face it, being at the right place at the right time is going to deliver a lot more value than doing intrinsic valuation right and investing based on that valuation. Obviously, you can't cannot manufacture luck, though you can be superstitious and pray to the gods that you will be lucky. But the truth is, this is out of your control. The way I see this is all I can do is value a company with all the information I have at the point in time that I do the valuation at the best of my ability. And the rest is out of my hands. So if the market moves in a different direction, there's no point beating myself up about something that I could not control. Valuation quality, market feedback, and luck will all play a role in whether you can convert your value to making money. So I'm going to leave you with 10 hopeful lessons that have come through this the, the core, uh, over the last 12 chapters. First, you know, I am not tied to models. So in chapter, chapter 3, when we talked about intrinsic value, you didn't like the capital asset pricing model, you don't like betas, I have no problem with you abandoning the CAPM or any risk and return model in finance. But you can't abandon first principles. First principles basically mean risk your assets of lower value. That's the first principles. How you measure risk comes from a model. So feel free to abandon models, but don't abandon first principles. Second, no matter how much you believe in, mark, in, in intrinsic value, pay heed to markets. When the market moves in the opposite direction from where you thought it would, don't dismiss the market as being shallow. 
Don't use words like bubbles because that effectively means you're refusing to even acknowledge that the market is moving in a different direction. So I, the, way, the words I use to describe markets is I respect markets, but I don't revere them, which means I think markets do make mistakes, but I'm not going to start with the presumption that when the market moves against me, the market is wrong and I'm right because I have to leave open the door that I'm the one who's wrong and the market is right. Third, and this goes back to the first point, risk does affect value. Now, whether you show that risk through a discount rate or whether you show that risk by taking the value you get and knocking it off or using a margin of safety, bring risk into your decision process because not doing so is not prudent. Fourth, we've talked about growth through this book and hopefully the message has come through that while higher growth seems like a good thing, it's not free. That higher growth requires reinvestment, which is a negative, and the net effect of growth can actually be negative. There are lots of companies be worth more if they refused, if they, if they said, look, we're not going to try to grow anymore. Fifth, no matter how great things look right now, all good things will come to an end. So when you look at a growth company, it looks amazing, has, has management that is revered. Remember, this too shall pass. At some point in time, the growth will come, to, come down and management will make mistakes, they're human. Six, and this is something that ran through especially the chapters on young startups and declining companies. Watch out for truncation risk. What is truncation risk? Normally, when you think about risk, you think about your cash flows in year six and ask yourself, am I right about those cash flows? Could I be wrong? Could they be too high or too low? You know what truncation risk is? Will there be a year six? We're not very good at dealing with truncation risk in valuation and investing. And we, I talked about how best to deal with truncation risk. Don't try to bring it into your discount rate. Bring it in as a separate factor. What is the chance I will not make it? What is the chance I'll be nationalized? What is the chance that terrorism will wipe out my assets? And then bring in the effect on your value. Much better way to deal with truncation risk. At the risk of stating the obvious, valuation is always about the future, but all our numbers are in the past. It's kind of an irony, right? So when we look at historical data, we expect to see things there that are going to help us forecast the future. And maybe there are things there. But look at the past. But in some companies, you might say, look, there's nothing there I'm going to learn because the business itself has changed. The world has shifted. Valuation is about the future. And you have to firmly you know, keep your eyes on that aspect of valuation. Draw on the law of large numbers. Let's face it. When you estimate a number, whether it's margin or cost of capital or revenue growth, you're making a point estimate. The reality is you're uncertain about the number. One of the ways you can reduce your uncertainty is by using the law of large numbers. How did this play out when we talked about betas? I talked about running a single regression and the beta that comes in the regression. And I said how much I mistrust that number. And then I suggest an alternative. Look at the average beta across 100 companies. You say, how does that help me? Well, the average beta across 100 companies is 10 times more precise than a single regression beta. It's a law of large numbers. All through this book, I've talked about uncertainty. And let's face it, uncertainty is a feature, not a bug. Don't run away from it. Deal with it. Face up to it. It's a healthier way than hiding from it and acting like it's not there. And lastly, every valuation you do, you're telling a story. Tell the story back to yourself. Ask yourself, do I believe this story? Ultimately, valuations don't come from Excel spreadsheets. They come from your story for a company. I hope you've enjoyed this book and reading about how to do valuation. But you know what? You learn valuation by doing. My advice to you is if you want to get, at, get better at valuation, pick a company and value it. Then pick another company, very different from the first one, and value it again. The more companies you value, the more you will get to know about valuation. I still tell people, I every time I value a company, I still learn something new about valuation. And that's 40 years into the process. I wish you the same. And I thank you very much for being along for this ride. Take care and good luck.